respect all of your time and Anisha's time. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the Arecibo Science Advocacy Partnership Lunchtime Talk Series or dinner time or breakfast time, depending on where you are and how late you sleep in. Uh, these talks are meant to bring together a community of people to discuss ideas and proposals for exciting new instruments um, at the Arecibo Observatory. Um, just a reminder to keep yourself muted throughout the talk. Um, the co-hosts will, will kind of keep an eye on that as well, but um, try to keep muted. You can type questions in the chat throughout the talk. And at the end of Anisha's talk, we will um, facilitate the questions. You're also welcome uh, at the end when we take questions to unmute and ask them yourself and, and participate in the discussion. We do hope there can be a discussion when the talk is over. Um, so we are super pleased to have Anish Roshi here today. He's the head of radio astronomy at Arecibo Observatory. Um, Anish graduated with an engineering degree in electronics and communications from the University of Kerala. Um, he went on to get his PhD from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, um, where he was also appointed to uh, the faculty. He was a Jansky Fellow. Um, at NRAL, um, and he also spent time at the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. Um, in 2010, he moved to NRAO, and uh, since 2018, he's been a senior observatory scientist uh, for radio astronomy at Arecibo, and as I mentioned before, he's the, now the head of radio astronomy there. Um, his research focus has primarily been uh, the galactic ISM, molecular cloud formation, massive star formation. But today, he's going to talk to us um, about the next generation Arecibo telescope. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Anish. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And thank you for uh, giving an opportunity to present uh, about NGAT. This uh, uh, talk is based on Team 10's work at NSF workshop. In that work, we have uh, divided the uh, realization of the full NGAT into three stages. The first stage is the refurbishment of the 305 meter dish for immediate experiments. Um, the second is a prototyping and then later developing a full NGAT. Um, after further discussions with the uh, uh, mechanical engineering group about the structure, we have changed the second and third stage a little bit. So in the, in the current presentation, I will be presenting an updated uh, uh, version of how we can build the full NGAT in seven years time scale. So in the... <clears throat> Uh, in this presentation, I will first discuss about uh, NGAT, then talk about, uh, then compare the capabilities of NGAT with uh, um, single dish, then talk about the challenges we have to uh, overcome, and then finally talk about uh, how we can realize this in seven years time scale. So these are the team members of the uh, team 10. Uh, there were uh, significant contributions to our discussions made by some of the members from other team which are also listed here. And in addition, I have also invited Francisco to be part of our panel. Um, the basic reason being that if we have to do, if we have to realize this telescope in seven years, whether it, whether it is NGAT or a single dish, um, it, the whole observatory has to be focused in that project and completed. So that's the only way it can be realized and Francisco's lead is certainly essential for doing that. Um, so uh, most of you know that we have um, put a white paper in February 2021. And in that white paper, we have uh, summarized the requirements for the next generation telescope, which are summarized here. For the planetary science, they want five megawatt of continuous wave transmitting power in the frequency range two to six gigahertz. They would like to have a beam width of one to two arc minute. This is basically because the new the position uncertainty of the newly uh, discovered NEOs are in of this order, and they also would like to have an increased sky coverage. The atmospheric science would like to have sky coverage in zenith angle from zero degree to 45 degree to observe both parallel and perpendicular to the geomagnetic field. 
and they would like to have 10 megawatts of uh, transmitting power at 430 megahertz and also there's a desire to have a 220 megahertz transmitter and their experiment requires excellent surface brightness sensitivity um, the radio astronomy required excellent sensitivity over 200 megahertz to uh, 30 gigahertz frequency range they would like to have increased uh, sky coverage and they would like to have pointing at least up to semi angle 48 degrees or 50 degrees uh, uh, so that they can observe the galactic center. All these three groups require uh, as much collecting area as possible. So we decided that the collecting area of the new telescope should be equivalent to a 300 meter diameter dish. The concept which we have uh, put in the uh, white paper is uh, an array of dishes all of them individually pointing, uh, all of them pointing to the same direction and they are fixed on a planar structure. And the sky, um, uh, sky coverage is obtained by uh, moving this plate, in, uh, in tilting this plate essentially. And, and this particular concept uh, not only meets all the requirements that I have listed, but also provide unique capabilities for all three research groups, which I will highlight throughout my talk. Now, in the white paper, we also discussed about multiple configurations that are possible within the concept which we have put in. You can have a 1,009 meter dish or a 415 meter dish. So the dish size has to be optimized based on what the maximum science return, the cost and frequency coverage. In the talk, I will assume it is a 1,009 meter dish only because for the cost estimate and other things, you can just multiply it by 1,000. So this is something which has to be finalized based on uh, progress made with on design. Now, many people are asked how this antenna looks like and the closest I could see is what, how uh, um, uh, is the cosmic mic microwave background imager. So the antenna structure essentially should look very similar to this. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and in this case, the size of this uh, structure is about six meter or so, and each of these dishes are one meter. For NGAT, the dishes will be almost touching to each other. So further, we have discussed this structure, um, uh, I mean, how to realize this structure with, uh, um, with the contractors who are helping us with the tower work as well as the cleaning. Uh, and they have suggested to break up the array into seven segments. So this is the structure of the uh, 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 structure of the telescope. They have suggested the uh, segments. The seven segments will be in an inclined plane. So you can either keep it in an inclined plane or keep it in the in the uh, in the ground. In the concept one, there will not be any shadowing uh, throughout the zenith angle coverage we want. Um, so I will, I, in the talk, I will assume that the structure of the telescope is uh, something like this, but again, this is something which has to be finalized based on further progress on the structure design and so on. So I will assume that uh, the telescope is, uh, uh, is have seven segments and is fully movable in azimuth and elevation. Um, uh, the uh, contractors also made some, uh, uh, given us some video to show how this whole structure works. So I'm going to share that video with you. So those are the seven segments moving in elevation. And that's the azimuth motion. Okay, so that's the uh, that's what they have shared with us, and the azimuth. Sorry, yeah, the azimuth motions can, and elevation motions can be, according to them, can be very similar to what we had before in the three knot five meter telescope. Okay, now. Um, so, in, uh, so I will now concentrate on comparing the capabilities of NGAT with uh, a blocked aperture single dish that has been proposed. 
uh, before doing the comparison, um, so I will go area by area, like radio astronomy, planetary, uh, I mean, space and atmospheric science and planetary science. So before starting the comparison, it is instructive to look at the sensitivity for each of these uh, individual segments and compare it with the existing telescope sensitivity, existing or, or what we had before. So this is the sensitivity A over T cis as a function of frequency. Uh, the dotted line here is the sensitivity of, of GBT. So one of the segments will have, will have a sensitivity exceeding that of GBT. This dotted, this dashed line is the sensitivity of our 305 meter telescope. Um, and four segments will exceed the sensitivity of uh, uh, sensitivity of the earlier telescope. And the green one is the full sensitivity of NGAT. So to, for comparison, let's first concentrate on the high frequency observations. So, so when I say high frequency, these are frequencies above eight gigahertz or so. I take a frequency range from eight to 30 gigahertz, which is what uh, has been discussed during the white paper uh, discussions. And there are several molecules, mole redshifted molecules that can be observed in this direction. So the, one of the most challenging experiment that can be done uh, uh, when, if you go to higher frequencies, look for a redshifted, redshifted molecular lines. And I will particularly concentrate on the CO, CO lines. So the, this, the CO one to zero is, uh, is what is shown in this uh, uh, blue line. And this is the CO two to one. And you can see the redshift coverage is about 2.8 to 10. Okay, for CO1 to 0 and for CO2 to 1, the redshift coverage will be about 6.2 6 to about 10. Okay. So now there are a lot of experiments that has been done uh, in CO. There are something like 200 detections already. And uh, what I have plotted here is I made a histogram of the number of detections that has been made by GBT and VLA over this uh, redshift range 2.6 to 6.2. Okay. I, 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 in fact, most of the detections are made by GPT as well and VLA, uh, particularly the VLA. Um, and this database was this data was taken from this reference, which is very old, uh, but not much more de detections I have seen with GPT at all. So the distribution of this number of detections are quite skewed. If you look at the sensitivity of GPT and VLA, it's roughly same. And so you can ask why this distribution is uh, skewed. And the reason is that the spectral stability of an unblocked aperture is not as good as an interferometer. And this the astronomers realized by spending $100 million. So uh, in my opinion, by building a blocked aperture single dish uh, telescope for such sensitivity observation, you are going to re re rediscover this fact by spending $300 million. So, uh, so now let's look at uh, how NGAT performs uh, for this experiment. So of course, at these frequencies, uh, um, the uh, atmospheric opacity contributes to the system temperature. Uh, so we need to know the statistics of that. This is a data provided by Luca based on the radio sonde data over a period 2016 to 2020. This is the water vapor content as a function of uh, uh, day number. And if you take a water vapor uh, column density of about 25 millimeter, so you will see uh, there are several days in a year where you can observe at water vapor uh, column densities less than 25 meters. So I, I would just take PW as a 25 millimeter as a cutoff for these observations. So with this cutoff and with the CFA model as well as the data available in the, in, a, uh, in the NASA website, you could construct a model for the SCFT or the expected SCFT as a function of frequency, which is what is plotted here. Uh, and with this SCFT, you can calculate what is the, what is the expected sensitivity for the redshifted CO observations. So uh, this plot shows the integrated flux density as a function of redshift. This curve is the expected integrated flux density of CO one to zero transition for galaxies with mass four times that of M51. The properties of M51 are given here. And this is the uh, expected CO two to one 
the integrated flux flux density for galaxies greater than three times the mass of M51. And the dotted line here is the expected one sigma um, sensitivity for CO1 to 0 and CO2 to 1 transition. And these sensitivity were estimated for three hours integration and 50 kilometers per second uh, uh, velocity resolution. And you can see that almost all the galaxies with, in the mass range three to four, um, uh, more than M31, three times uh, M31, you can detect with the NGAT over this uh, uh, redshift range 2.8 to 9. Okay. And NGAT provides the spectral stability to do this because it's basically a little problem. And if you compare the survey speed of this instrument, it outperforms all other uh, existing or upcoming facilities in the near future. Okay. So now let's consider that, uh, okay, if the um, single dish is not competitive enough for high frequency, let's restrict its frequency, upper frequency cutoff to something like three gigahertz or so, okay? So that will uh, bring down the cost of building that uh, building the single dish. Let's say it is about 200 million or less. So the competition comes from fast as well as DSA because both of them roughly operates up to up to this frequency range. And DSA is a hundred million project. Okay, and there are three major projects that can be done in that frequency range. One is the fast radio burst, the nanogram, and extragalactic H1. A fast radio burst requires the field of view and as well as sensitivity. DSA has both of them. Uh, nanogram has the sky coverage and sensitivity. Again, DSA has both of them. A single dish doesn't have as much sky coverage as the FAST, for example. In this case, the single dish, in the case of FRB, single dish doesn't have the field of view. And for extragalactic galactic uh, H1, you need the spectral stability, sensitivity, as well as sky coverage. All of them DSA has, uh, but a single dish lacks spectral stability as well as the vast sky coverage required for these observations. So single dish is not competitive to DSA 2000, even if you say that it can be built with $100 million. So now let's compare uh, the capability of NGAT with uh, other facilities. In terms of the field of view and sensitivity, in terms of sky coverage and sensitivity, in terms of spectral stability, sensitivity, and sky coverage, NGAT outperforms all other facilities. And in the for the case of H1, the spectral stability basically comes from the fact that it is a, a it is an interferometric interferometric telescope. Now there are uh, I would like to mention a couple of experiments which can be done with NGAT, uh, uh, which single dish can very uh, cannot I mean essentially cannot do it, and one of them is the cosmological experiments. So if you if you look at uh, uh, an upcoming telescope, the COD telescope, which is a new telescope which is coming up in Canada. Uh, the primary goal of this experiment is to detect H1, uh, to make H1 intensity mapping. And if you look at the structure of the configuration of the telescope, it's very similar to the uh, NGAT configuration, okay? But there's a huge difference between the performance of these two, these two telescopes. The, what the cosmologists are trying to measure in this, uh, uh, in this particular experiment is to look for the power spectrum, is to measure the power spectrum of a stochastic signal in the sky. So at any given direction in the sky, you will have one realization of that stochastic process. So in a drift scan observations, like in COD, these antennas cannot be tracked. It is a drift scan observation they will be doing. You, the different realizations of the, of the stochastic process will pass through the, pass through the beam of this telescope. And therefore, they cannot average the visibilities coherently. On the other hand, because in NGAT you are trying to, you, are, you can track the source, you will be always looking at the same realization of the stochastic process, and therefore you can average the visibilities coherently. And this makes a huge difference in the sensitivity. The power spectrum, power spectrum of the measurement goes as uh, as uh, proportional to the time in the case of NGAT and proportional to square root of the time in the case of a telescope like COD. Okay. So this opens up a lot of new experiments that can be done with NGAT, including the measuring the power spectrum of H1, CO, as well as, uh, as, well as the 
you can also explore um, the structure of the helium reionization in the universe. The second thing which I want to mention is that NGAD can do very well uh, combining the visibilities we measure with the NGBLA. So this is a cumulative distribution of NGBLA antennas as a function of baseline. So uh, you can see at baselines less than 500 meters or so, there's hardly any measurements the NGAD makes, uh, NGBLA makes, and there we can provide the visibilities. So by combining visibilities of uh, NGAD and NGBLA, we are NGBLA will become tremendously sensitive to surface, uh, uh, surf, um, low surface brightness um, uh, to make low surface brightness observations. Okay, and this is possible up to thirty gigahertz or so. Okay, because we we cannot operate above that. So so this uh, slide shows the summary of what I have said. If you look at the different experiments that can be done, NGAT can do. Uh, much better compared to a single dish, uh, single dish telescope, okay? So if you want to make advances in astronomy, if you want to make new experiments to be done at the Recibo, we need an NGAT. So that is the case for astronomy. Now I will look at the planet um, uh, space and atmospheric science. So the requirement for the space and atmospheric science is that the uh, transmitter power should be about 10 megawatt or so at 230 and 220 megahertz. Uh, the cost of this transmitter is well constrained because uh, these are transmitters that has been developed by developed by F SRI for the um, for the AMISA project, and the cost of 10 megawatt is about 30 million or so. Uh, but the uh, uh, transmitters which SRI has developed has very low efficiency, but nowadays I have seen um, uh, 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 transmitters with 65% efficiencies available and they are, all, they are also broadband transmitters, okay? So there is no issue in uh, having uh, equipment NGAT with the uh, atmospheric, the transmitters for the atmospheric application. Um, so this plot shows the power aperture product as a function of the segment size of the NGAT. And with three segments and with this 10 megawatt power, you will exceed the performance of the Gregorian system. And with four segments and 10 megawatt power, you will exceed the performance of the line feed system. So now we will compare the ISR features for a, a, a single dish and NGAD. Um, now I, I, I haven't heard what is the power um, aiming for the single dish, but for NGAD we have about 10 megawatt of power. And for future upgrade, it is quite easy to do uh, transmitter upgrades with NGAD because it's an array. You don't have the issue of uh, uh, heat dissipation in one, one particular region uh, where you have to keep all the transmitters. Um, and there were, uh, there were discussion about having multiple K vectors, the spatial K vectors, and there were discussion that the single dish can have two domes or two subreflectors, which certainly increases the blockage and certainly increases the cost. But NGIT will give you seven different K vectors because the uh, each of those segments can be tilted in different elevation. Okay, and similarly for uh, the K, because the K vector also depends on the wavelength, you can have these seven segments uh, operating at seven different frequencies. So you'll have seven uh, frequency spec K vectors also. The other interesting possibility with the NGAT is that uh, you can do volumetric imaging of ionospheric plasma. This is a image. Uh, uh, this is an image which I got from the ISCAD website. Uh, if you look at the scales here, these are the antenna positions of the ISCAD scales here. They are much smaller than they are smaller than the NGAT scales. And this is the visibility is measured with this sort of an array. And this is the point spread function. So NGAT can do this much better than what ISCAD is doing. Okay. And in the near future, if you want. Uh, 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 resolution, this gives only resolution corresponding to a baseline of 300 meters, if you use NGAT alone. You can always add a set of small dipoles 
and cross correlate it with the segments of the NGAT. And those visibilities will have very good sensitivity because the sensitivity of each cross correlation goes as the square root of the area of the segment times the area of uh, area of the dipole. Okay, so this is a very interesting possibility I could see with the NGAT. So to summarize, again, uh, none of these experiments, none of these features which I have listed, ST can provide, but NGAT can provide all of them. So NGAT will be a unique instrument for ISR application, allowing the possibility of several new experiments at LCBO. So now let's look at the planetary science. Um, so the planetary science, uh, the, plan the transmitters for the planetary radar is the most, one of the most complicated uh, uh, um, instrumentation in NGAT. So I call it as challenge number two. I will come to challenge number one later. So the transmitter frequency is about five gigahertz. Uh, uh, that's, that's what we have put in the white paper. Uh, today, the transmitter cost is about 65 million per megawatt. Okay, this is obtained from the EM powers, um, um, uh, talking to the EM, EM power RF guys. Okay, and this co the, uh, the cost of these transmitters can be brought down if you have in house development and also if you wait for the market to drop the chip cost. Okay, but there are uncertainties right now in the market because of the COVID. And we still don't know how much the cost will come down because of the in-house development. So we will put a cap on the uh, transmitter cost about 100 million or so. With this 100 million, the most conservative estimate I can I can get is about we, we can get about two to three megawatts in five years time scale. I mean this is a very conservative estimate. Um, and but the major issue I still see is that all these transmitters have only tra efficiency of about 35 percent or so. The, so for two megawatt of transmission, you need to have a generation of about six megawatt. So that that is a major issue, and we have to put a, a, a efforts to develop high efficiency transmitters. So now let me compare uh, the system factor of the radar as a function of NG, NGAT segments. And this is made with for two and three megawatts. So the two colors represent for two and three megawatt. And again, um, by fourth segment or so, we will, uh, uh, the NGAT will exceed the three performance of the 305 meter s band. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I want to make a point, that, so I, uh, so as you can see, by four, uh, both transmitter performance exceed by four segments or so. And in fact, they can go even higher by just uh, putting money on the on the transmitter because uh, um, because these transmitters, high power transmitters, are available in the market. It's only the cost which is limiting us to this what were two megawatt or what were ten megawatts. So in fact, if you want to reduce the structure cost, you can have three segments. And increase the increase the money and the electronics to get the get the performance high, much higher than the three three not five meter S band system or the earlier ISR system, but that astronomers cannot do it. So astronomers require money in the in the in the steel. Okay, so this makes the, building this instrument very very interesting. Um, okay, so. Uh, I will compare the performance of the NGAT planetary radar with the uh, with other um, other facilities, and with two megawatt we outperform all other facilities, including GB, GBT to and GVLA um, by static operations. Okay, and it will be a fantastic instrument for uh, uh, planetary defense, as you can see the range uh, here. And the other great thing is that uh, the NGAT will have the wide field of view and high transmitter for do, doing the space debris studies. This, this may need a duplexer with a different uh, uh, receiver um, because of the short round trip, uh, round trip travel time. And the future is always bright for the planetary science because uh, uh, the market is flooded with the uh, uh, transmitters. I mean, and uh, in future, people are going to make high power uh, cheap transmitters. And anytime you can um, 
anytime in the future you could upgrade these transmitters with a with higher power transmitter and this is easily possible in ngit compared to uh, simple dish because we don't have the problem with the heat dissipation so to summarize, NGAT will be the most powerful radar for planetary defense. It will also be the perfect instrument to detect space debris in geo as well as cislunar, cislunar space. So now let me look at the challenges that need to be overcome. One of the things that has been pointed out is the grating lobes. Because the spatial frequencies in this array are not Nyquist sample, you need to, there will be certainly grating lobes. Our initial simulation shows that if you have a taper at, at the edge of each of these individual dishes about 10 dB, then the, um, then the grating lobe amplitudes can be brought down to the level as the first side lobe of the array. There are other ways of doing, other ways of suppressing the grating lobe. One of them is to have different size dishes and a group at uh, uh, Stewart Observatory after seeing our website, uh, after seeing our white paper, did, the, did some simulation with a, a multi-dish uh, multi antennas. And they have shown that you can bring down this uh, uh, grating lobe much lower than 20 dB or so. So I don't think this grating lobe issue is a major issue. Uh, the other thing which is con other concern is about the maintenance. Of course, uh, the number of dish, although I'm taking it as 1,000, it can be anywhere between 1,000 and 400. It need not be exactly 1,000. The other advantage in the case of maintenance is that all the array elements are confined to one location, unlike in conventional interferometer. So this eases the maintenance. And if you look at the if you look at the array, the uh, the um, the component which requires the major maintenance is the GM coolers. The average GM cooler maintenance period is about thousand days or so. And NGVLA has done experiments to run this GM coolers at variable speed. So that will certainly uh, low, uh, bring down the cost of operation and it also bring the, increases this maintenance period. Okay. The other options which we have are use telling pulse tube coolers. These are essentially maintenance free because these are developed for space application, but their capacity is low, um, but that may be okay for NGAT because we need to only cool two, tri two amplifiers. Um, the other issue with the pulse cool, pulse cool, uh, pulse tube coolers are that the efficiency depends on the inclination. Because the NGIT operates in the zenith angle range zero to fifty, this also may be tolerable for our application. We also looked at the failure rates in the array for VLA and MWA, and the failure rates are less than five percent. So I don't think that is a major issue. The other issue that has been raised is the facing of the transmitter. So JPL has done some experiments to do the facing. They had a three antenna system and five antenna system. They demonstrated the two ways of facing, facing the uh, array and uh, it was their experiments were successful. One is the moon bouncing and another one is having a receiver tower and having a loop back system. Uh, and both were successful, but one, one great thing about NGAT is that we don't have to do fringe stopping for this phasing because the, uh, uh, the relative change in the antenna positions are, are not there. Uh, that is not true for the case of conventional interferometry, and that makes the correlator design much simpler, okay, when you use it as a receiver. The other thought I have uh, about phasing is that there are uh, satellites called this rigid space uh, satellites, which has a sphere of calibrated cross, radar cross section of about one meter square. If I calculate uh, the scattered power from these spheres with a nine meter antenna and two kilowatt each, and two kilowatt is required for the two megawatt uh, planetary transmitter, uh, then I'll get signal to noise ratio much greater than 20. So it looks like you could use these satellites for facing, and these satellites. Uh, goes around the sky every two hours or so. Okay, So this is a thought with that need to be demonstrated. So the, uh, the other thing which I have, uh, which has been raised is uh, the difficulty in making upgrades. Certainly it is true that the system upgrades will be much simpler for a single dish. Uh, probably a professor and a set of students can do that upgrade. 
but that's not the way a scientific community or facility instruments are nowadays done. Nowadays, facility instrument upgrades involves a large group of scientists and engineers. And for, for example, you can look at the VLA upgrades, EVLA, and now it's going to NGVLA and so on. So NGAT will provide many opportunities for the next generation researchers to do such, uh, such, such activities. So finally, I'll come to the cost of the system. So my estimate cost, whatever I have shown so far, I consider this as the worst case because uh, um, I have uh, put enough tolerance in many of these many of these estimates uh, so that I want to see how much uh, above 450 million we, we will be going. Okay, the only uncertainty which I mean, the only thing which I'm still not sure is the structure which we will get in few months. I will tell you how. Um, the planetary transmitter we put a, a cap of about thousand, uh, uh, about hundred million, and as I said, the challenge is to build a two to three megawatt uh, uh, transmitter in hundred million with, uh, uh, with, uh, with in five years time scale. The SAS transmitter cost is very robust. The receiver correlator and all other electronics required for this planetary uh, plan, uh, planetary radar and the ISR radar, uh, it all comes to about uh, 100 million or so. You can look at the DSA estimate. These are all public. SK estimates uh, are also there, which gives, gives you the front end cost. And you can, you can build all those things in $100 million. So that leaves something like 200 million for the structure. Okay, um, I will include something like 20 million extra. So let's say 220 million, uh, we have to build the structure in 220 million. And that is, that is the number one challenge. And we will know this in a couple of months because the contractors are interested to do this for us free. Okay, so the total cost it turns out to be about 450 million. And this include all the contingency required that are going into this 100 million. Uh, because I have taken the higher rates in there. So it looks like uh, uh, NGAT can be built in 450 million. Uh, yeah, now I will tell you how this uh, the telescope can be realized. We have been discussing that with the structural engineers. Uh, so what they suggest is we can have structural simulation and also have a finite element model. If you have that, then you don't have to do any uh, prototyping. And this is a way, for example, GPT is built. Uh, we, we don't see a, a prototype of say a 25 meter or 50 meter of GPT. So GPT was built based on the, FE, the confidence people have on a FE model. And the finite element model is essential for the phasing also. And this is well proved in GPT because GPT can phase uh, up to 28 gigahertz just by using the finite element model. Okay, and then what remains is the EM simulation. And uh, so you need to do the EM simulation and verify that. And for verifying, you need a prototype, which can be about a six to 10 meter prototype operating at six, uh, operating at one frequency, something like C or X band. And, uh, and that uh, you need only a room temperature receiver and a trans low power transmitter for doing that. And once you verify that, um, you, are, you will be confident on the EM simulation. So these R&Ds can be done in about two to three years. That's what we think. And then the construction can be in four to five years. So totally something like seven years, you can construct this telescope. So to summarize, we have at least two options. One is the single dish with 300 million and five years time scale and NGAT with 450 million and seven years time scale. So we choose the NGAT because it brings many new and exciting research capabilities. And of course the new design has its own challenges and we have to face that. And the cost estimation of NGAT is becoming more and more robust. And we think that the NGAT can be constructed in seven years or so. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so please go ahead and type your questions in the chat. There are some that are already there and I will start with those. Um, you may also unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. Before we get to questions, I am throwing in the chat a link 
to um, a very short feedback survey form about this talk series. Um, I wanna thank Pia Sal uh, Salter Ghosh for, for putting that together. So if you have um, I, thoughts on the talks that have happened so far and what you'd like to see going forward, please take a moment to fill that out. But let's move on to questions. We have some good time for discussion. Um, so the, the first question we have um, is what, what is fringe stopping? And um, somebody, Avi wrote in the chat a, a partial response to that, but Anish, can you elaborate a little bit more on what fringe stopping is? Um, so the, in interferometer, if you have two antennas which are fixed on the ground, and if when you track the source, the delay, there will be a geometric delay between the, between the two antennas, which will keep continuously changing. Uh, in the case of NGAT, because the antennas are uh, fixed on a plate, there is no delay change between the antennas. And this delay change is what is called the fringe stopping. Okay, thank you. Um, we have Jonathan Friedman who asks, what would be the plans for the HF radar in this scenario? Uh, HF heating radar? Well, yeah, that, that depends on where we have to install this uh, uh, NGAT which is, uh, uh, I mean, to me, that is the most political question. <laughs> uh, so in my particular preference is uh, um, at the place where we had the 305 meter telescope itself, um, purely because of politics. Um, uh, unless the geologists say that it is, uh, uh, it is not feasible to do it there, okay. Uh, now, in, if that is the case, then the HF heating has to be transported to some other place uh, within the observatory. And there are, you don't need a dish for the HF heating. You can have, you can realize that in other ways. So we may have to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Luca asks, is there any estimate for ground thermal radiation entering the side lobes or even the grading lobes at low elevations? I'm not sure at 40 degrees you will have, where is the great thing low? Uh, the grating lobe that is at 1.4 gigahertz is at uh, 1.5 degrees from the main lobe. That, that, will be the, that will be the strongest grating lobe. So at 50 degrees is zenith angle, I doubt it will be looking at the ground. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert asks, do the plans include using a few larger dishes to fill in the zero spacings like Alma? It seems this could be done relatively easily here and would be valuable. Um, well, if you go for a 19 meter dish, then you need a 18 meter dish to fill the spacing. So if you, if you want, we can have, I mean, the a, a NGVLA, uh, uh, one of the NGVLA dish will be certainly available at the site because they want to do VLV experiments. So that can be used for filling the zero spacing. Okay, okay and, and Dana has another question. What kind of feed will yield a 100 to one frequency coverage? Uh, it's not 100 to one frequency. It is a one is to four feed. Well, one is to four frequency coverage feeds. And that is, uh, uh, that is the feed recommended by Sandy Vainter who has uh, ex experience in building these things. We initially was looking for one is to six, but he said, go for one is to four. Okay. Um, so Chris asks, should we not be undertaking atmospheric monitoring for transparency on a war footing? Uh, well, uh, there is already data exists at Arecibo. We, I haven't got into that yet. Um, uh, I am working with uh, uh, Pedrina. Uh, see, there are multi-frequency, I mean, um, dual frequency GPS measurements done at the site, and that is enough to get the statistics of uh, statistics of uh, atmospheric water vapor content. And this is available for several years uh, since observatory, I mean, since GPS was invented. I think. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I don't think anything new is required to get that information. The data is already there. So, so unless I complete that analysis, I cannot uh, uh, comment on that whether we need something new. Okay. Um, Tapashi asks, does the sinkhole play any part in the design? 
Not really. I mean, uh, so if this structure is going to come at the place where the 305 meter is uh, is located, then it will be uh, located at the rim where the rim rim road is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question I'm sure you've heard uh, many times with the dishes so closely packed, is there any concern of tr uh, crosstalk between the electronics? Of yes. Electronics? Uh, yes, there will be cr crosstalk. This is something that has to be studied through simulations. Uh, um, and uh, that is one of the concerns with going with this 10 dB taper. So essentially, when you uh, taper, taper the illumination by 10 dB, there will be spillover of that uh, radiation to the next uh, antenna. And to a large extent, this has been characterized by the CMB experiments because they face the same trouble. So we have enough uh, enough uh, uh, studies that has been done connected with the CMB experiments about the crosstalk between antennas. So uh, we can start from there, but certainly we have to do such simulations, EM simulations. Are there is there uh, infrastructure in place to do those simulations? Is that you know something that you see is pretty? It's uh, um, it's pretty straightforward. You can do any of the um, this uh, EM modeling software like FACO or HFSS and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so Dash asks, um, well, having a slightly different dish size or different dis dish sizes on different segments at at least two versions help in overcoming ambiguity due to grading ropes. Uh, how do you overcome the ambiguity? Is that what the question is. Um, so I will invite Desh to unmute if if uh, they want to. Um, but yeah, um, can you clarify your question? Yeah. Uh, so the grating globes will be at different uh, distances from the main beam. If the distances, the separation between dishes will be different in the two segments, and in case of any, you know potential discoveries and ambiguities about which direction things were coming from, uh, this will help to resolve that ambiguity. You mean the different dish sizes? Yes, different dish sizes, hence different separations. Okay, yeah. Essentially, the UV sampling will not be uniform. Yes, it will not be. And but that you is the one with two things. versions. Yeah. I'm sorry. And so it might even decorrelate um, across the two. Uh, uh, so because the UV sampling is randomized because of the different dish size, that is the one which is killing the grating lobe. And essentially, the uh, grating lobe power gets spread around. You mean it's already reduced? Uh because of the random sampling. Yes, yeah, it will be. And that's what this simulation shows. And this has been done in an, another oh, so it's already It's already incorporated. OK. Yeah. It's already incorporated in this particular simulation by done by the, um, the steward observatory guys. All right. Yeah, thanks. OK, thank you. Um, Chris has a, two questions. So any comments on the contribution of NGAT to VLBI? And how about the polarization characteristics of NGAT? Uh, I, I don't see any issues with the uh, VLBI observations because uh, 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 it will be working like a phased array system. And so there won't be any issues with the, uh, the polarization or uh, um, any other issues? I, I don't see any problem with the VLB observations. It is like a, an um, interferometer used as a VLA used as a phased element for inter, for uh, VLB experiments. It will be much better than that because the beam is much better. Will it be part of the VLBI? I think. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and then separately from the VLBI, the the polarization capabilities. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, I, 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 that's what I said. I, I don't think there will be issues with the polarization capabilities at the level at which the VLBA is done. But there, uh, because the there the polarization you have to worry about is the polarization near the center of the primary beam of this telescope. So that should be okay. I don't think it. But extended polarization, I need to check. And and at lower level, I need to check how the coupling between the antenna affects that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, Hector asks, why should this be constructed at the AO site rather than another site with better atmospheric transmission at higher frequencies and less RFI? Mm, well, um, well, it's always, uh, um, okay, the reasons that has been given is the same thing as what is there in the white paper. So we have been using this site for a large number of uh, um, atmospheric studies. And so you want to continue that studies. The second is it is closer to the equators. Therefore, uh, uh, you can see both north and south for the new uh, detections. Um, and yeah, it's certainly true that uh, uh, for RFI, uh, from the RFI point of view, this is not the ideal place. We could have put it in some desert. But, but uh, the other thing is the infrastructure is already there. So why not use that infrastructure to do that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I suppose that's probably a question that will have to be really strongly argued going forward for, for any instrument. Um, at, at AO. Um, Marshall asks, could, could the NGAT um, interoperate with four channel VGOS? Uh, four channel? Marshall, do you want to elaborate on that? It's for some reason, I cannot see the chance. So, so. Ah, okay. Uh, he's, he says he's coming. <laughs> Let me see. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I now see the chat. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, there's different flavors of VLBI. There's the existing SX geodetic VLBI, which I certainly hope that the NGAT could interoperate with, but that's already becoming somewhat obsolete. There's the VGOS, the, the, the geodetic VLBI. The original, the 12 meter, I think it is, antenna was put there as possibly a VGOS site. I don't think that's ever going to happen, but, um, but VGOS could certainly use having an occasional very big partner coming in. Vigos observes four one gigahertz channels spread over from three to 14 gigahertz. Although I think it's a little less typically a three to 12 gigahertz, something like that, but they can go up to 14. And then of course there's the uh, NG VLBA or NG VLA, sorry, which will use sort of all of these things and more so. And so I'm sure that interoperation with NG VLA is gonna be an issue, but I'm wondering in the short term, could it operate with um, the VIGOS, which is sort of a, the new standard now? Well, that complicates the receivers because they need a particular uh, band with a set of uh, filters for the VIGOS observation that is sort of standardized. Now, we can have the following possibilities. See, VIGOS don't require the full NGAT. So we can have a small set of antennas equipped with that. That will be the most economic way of doing this. And note that the VIGOS is, um, is linearly polarized. They use record both, both polarizations all the time and then use software to convert it back to circular polarized. Um, so that is, that is a, a complication there, but that does allow for very wide bandwidths with one feed. And okay. that's what, what the whole system is designed around. And in particular, by the way, F over D too. I'm not sure if you have the same F over D as Vigo. So if you don't have the same F over D, you probably can't use their feed. So that's another thing to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I have a quick question, if I may, that something that stood out to me was the uh, transmitter efficiency when you were talking about the, the planetary transmitter um, of 35%. I think this was your challenge number two. And you, you mentioned that we need to invest in making lower cost, high efficiency transmitters, um, but also that these things are, will happen. And I, I don't have a good sense of, you know, how hopeful are you that we can overcome that challenge that there, you know, we can get uh, reasonably cost high, higher efficiency transmitters than what we, what's currently in the works. Okay, there are two issues there. One is the cost, the second is the efficiency. Right. They are completely decoupled. I mean, uh, some way it is coupled, but uh, let's for the argument, let's keep it decoupled. Okay. So if you take the cost, I am 100% confident that the cost will come down because when I look at the articles in the, any of the engineering journal, everybody is pushing for developing high power solid state amplifiers in the near future. Okay. And that is going to drive down the cost. And everybody I talk to in the transmitter field, they are, they are very optimistic the cost is going to drive down. By regarding the efficiency, 
I am not 100% sure whether you can increase the efficiency because I don't know what is causing that lower efficiency yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you look at the device efficiencies, what is quoted is about 65%. And if you have class F amplifier, you should have got close to 60%. But I don't know where the efficiency is getting dropped. So I need to look at that. OK. OK, thank you. Um, so Chris asks, uh, could you elaborate on the pointing of NGAT, uh, especially given the extreme requirements um, at high frequencies? Uh, the pointing will be done exactly like what we do at the interferometer. You, you find the solutions uh, by doing an interferometer observation on, on uh, uh, point sources. And then um, it's uh, similar to what uh, we do at GBT, um, uh, where you need to adjust the panels to get the, uh, get the maximum, um, uh, maximum efficiency. So you need to do two things. One is the phase adjustment between the transmitter, which will come from the FE model. And then the, any other corrections that has to be done has to be done by observing a, a point source. Mm -hmm. And up to 28 gigahertz, GBT has routinely doing, even today GBT does uh, routinely by, uh, uh, by using FEM, FEM models for uh, uh, facing their panels. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the facing those panels is similar to facing this array. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eliana asks, um, for the space sciences perspective, the operating AMISRs have range resolution of kilometers versus the former Odyssey ball of 150 meters. Also, they've not been able to observe the gyro line and the plasma line observations are not that common. AO did it in real time. What are the configurations of the new AMISR NGAT that can allow the capabilities of the former 430 megahertz ISR radar? Well, as I understand, if you have a transmitter, uh, uh, a single beam transmitter in NGAT and uh, 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 with uh, limited grating lobes and other things, it should work exactly identical to the earlier 305 meter, but with better A over T6, a, a, a power aperture product. And I don't know the details about uh, um, whether it affects any plasma line measurement, I, I don't know that and uh, I need to talk to Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Dana asks a logistics question if a, tra a text transcription will be available um, for all of this. So for that, I'll need to check in with, with Mike who appears to be here, but is I believe not actually here right now. He, this is, he's recording it. I believe there'll be a, a text transcription as well. So um, we'll make that available as soon as we know, but I'll need to double check that with Mike. But I think the short answer is yes. Um, any other questions? We're almost at the top of the hour. Hey, Anisha, this is Phil, I had a question. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, if you try to measure multiple K vectors by moving the seven segments differently do you start to have a blockage problem no there is no blockage in the in the structure which they have shown oh well uh, if you have but a different, they, they, different they, yes probably yes yeah okay. we have to look into that yeah okay great other questions feel free to unmute or type them in the chat Okay, um, if not, I'm, um, I'm gonna, oh. oh sorry, this is Flora, just a curiosity question, uh, whether in, uh, in the budget or uh, spec that Anish proposed, actually uh, they um, are actually considering also the uh, input power requirement for the system overall. Well, uh, at the moment, it looks to me it is dominated by the planetary transmitter. Okay, so the total power required uh, for the planetary transmitter will be about six megawatt if we, if we have a two megawatt transmitter, and then they need the cooled uh, um, uh, cooled receivers. Uh, so that will add a, 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 a probably close to another megawatt. So it will be seven megawatt of power is what is required, the minimum is required for this uh, telescope operation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other other final questions? 
Anisha, I had one more question. I'm I'm a little bit still a bit con confused about how exactly you can put all these receivers and transmitters in front of a nine meter dish without having terrible blockage. Yeah, that that is something which has to be looked into because uh, uh, the nine meter is an example, as I said. So we have to work on uh, optimizing that. And one of the inputs that should go is uh, what you said. And but you you know you should look into NGVLA is building six meter antennas with multiple multiple feed in it. Okay, so we can look at the uh, look at their design and see. Uh, because they 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 have uh, a subset of antennas with uh, multiple feet, and the size of that, if I'm not mistaken, is six meters. But are they a close packed array like the NGAT? No, they are not. Okay, yeah. But you can share the uh, structure in the NGAT. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Any last questions? So I want to I want to remind everybody I put the the feedback form again in the chat I gave a shorter link that you know hopefully will work for you. Um, I also want to invite anyone who's not already part of the Arecibo Science Advocacy Partnership group to join. Um, where what you can do is is go to AdecibosScience.org, which is um, their website. And there is a place to click on um, how to join. It's just a very short Google form. And you can also sign up for various um, focused efforts uh, to, to work toward the future of Arecibo. Um, and with that, I want to really thank Dr. Anish Roshi for being here with us and giving us a great talk and having a really great discussion. Thank you to all of you who joined us and who contributed to this discussion and asked great questions. Um, and please stay tuned for the next in the series and stay tuned for um, posting the, the, the transcript and the recording of this as well. Um, okay, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's it. Bye.